We already knew that COVID-19 could jump from bats to humans. Now scientists say it's jumping from minks to humans and picking up genetic changes along the way. Changes to the spike protein producing a COVID-19 mutation scientists have dubbed cluster five. What happens in the mink is that uh, you have a lot of, uh, the, the animals are very susceptible. That means that you have easy virus circulation in the population. But uh, since you have a lot of minks on a small area. Like tightly packed in a fur farm. And so you have more mutations. The WHO says at least six countries have now detected COVID at Ming farms. But it's the cluster five mutation that has some experts worried. Scientists suspect that hundreds of people may have been infected by minks, and Danish authorities identified 12 people with this mutation. That prompted the Danish government to announce a plan to cull the country's entire mink population. That's 17 million animals, a drastic move for the world's biggest mink for a producer. We're taking all necessary and appropriate actions, including the culling of all remaining mink in Denmark. My future is in shambles, this farmer says. Parts of northern Denmark now in lockdown. The grim work has already started. But the farmers, lobbyists and politicians are fighting back. The plan met fierce resistance. The parliament put it on hold. This is an unprecedented situation, as it is for many other sectors. And I don't think we want to overreact and to, uh, to kill off an industry until we have seen exactly what lessons can be learned from the scientists around uh, how this mutation of the virus has developed in Denmark. But other countries taking no chances. In Spain, they've called some 100,000 minks. And the Dutch, who have also identified the cluster 5 mutation in minks, but not in humans, are wiping out their entire mink population. Having those disease reservoirs, essentially from a very minority industry, producing something we don't need, can we as a society... That's the question that has to be asked in the U.S. And we as a society really afford to have this reservoir continuing to exist in our society. The Dow jumping 470 points today on the news that Moderna's vaccine candidate is 94.5% effective a week after Pfizer said its vaccine candidate is 90% effective. Dr. Anthony Fauci saying high-risk groups could get a vaccine by the end of this year. We project that by the end of December that there will be doses of vaccines available for individuals in the higher risk category uh, from both companies. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joining me now. Uh, Dr. Patel, this vaccine news could not come at a better time. According to the COVID tracking project, 70,000 Americans are in the hospital with COVID right now. So let's talk about what these announcements from Moderna and Pfizer mean for us in the short term and in the longer term. Yeah, Allison, good to be with you. And you're right. It is a, a bright light at an end of a very long, dark tunnel that we've gone through. Here's what we know. We know that Pfizer and Moderna, both through press releases, have released uh, efficacy data, 90 in Pfizer's case, 94.5% in Moderna's case, unheard of efficacy rates for the coronavirus that give us hope that a vaccine would be available, as Dr. Fauci mentioned, to high priority populations by the end of the year. This type of vaccine does have some complexities in terms of how it needs to be stored. You need it's, uh, The Pfizer one, for example, Allison requires really, really ultra cold freezers that are not conventionally seen in pharmacies and clinics and hospitals. The good news is the Moderna vaccine can be stable in a refrigerator for about 30 days, which makes it conceivably a little easier to distribute. But at the end of the day, Allison, it's two shots separated by at least three to four weeks, and then several weeks after that second dose to get immunity. So even if the shots were available tomorrow, Allison, we would still have months where we had to wait to get the benefits of those vaccines. And that does mean, as the reporting you just did, we're going to have some dark months ahead with more cases, hospitalizations, and unfortunately deaths before we get the benefit of the vaccine. So, Dr. Patel, I'd love for you to repeat that if you don't mind, because I don't think that's something we have talked about very much. And I think our viewers might be curious about that. I think some people thought, OK, we'll get a vaccine potentially to uh, emergency workers or essential workers at the beginning of the year. And then the average person might get it in the spring. And then, boom, you've got the vaccine. You're OK. But once you get the vaccine, you're saying there's still the period where you have to wait before there's a protection there. 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. Allison, so here's how the vaccine works. Okay. It basically introduces it. Think of it this way. It introduces into your body the ability, the genetic material, messenger RNA, that can actually reproduce that spiky protein on the coronavirus that we've all come to learn by watching those red spikes. It creates a messenger RNA kind of program, training your muscles to recognize that spiky protein so that if you do get infected, it can fight the infection by creating those antibodies. But it doesn't happen overnight. So you need at least two shots and then the body has to rev up. It's like building you know, your muscles. You don't just go overnight to ripped and built. It can take several weeks. That's exactly what the immune system needs to do. So we absolutely are going to have a situation, Allison, in 2021, where we will have people vaccinated, but we'll still need to be taking some conservative measures, masks, washing hands, some degree of distancing, but I'm hoping that we're getting closer to normal. But by the time a young, healthy adult gets this vaccine, Allison, just because of worldwide demand, it will likely be late summer, possibly fall. So we need to brace ourselves for that patience that will be required until that time. And Dr. Patel, I love that analogy you made about it's like going to the gym, right? You don't go to the gym once and all of a sudden you're ripped and you've got washboard abs. It takes a little time uh, for the muscles to react to what you're doing to them. A great analogy uh, for how we should think about this vaccine and how it takes hold. Uh, we do know that vaccines have never been developed so quickly. So what do you say to our viewers who are, are, are cautiously optimistic, who are excited, but are still nervous about the safety here, uh, about possible side effects, especially long-term side effects, since we have not had the time uh, to test for those? Yeah, so I'll give you kind of everything we know. This is not the first time that this type of technology, messenger RNA, has been tried. It has been tried before in different viruses, HIV, respiratory viruses. It has not worked. But that benefit, Allison, of all those decades of knowledge are what led us here to be able to fast track it. So that should give people, including me, I'm looking forward to looking at the data and taking this vaccine if the data matches what the press releases say. But to your point, we have not studied the long-term side effects. And that's why I think we should have some caution. We should be excited, but we need to keep following as people are getting more and more and more doses. We will be looking as the FDA will for those side effects. And hopefully they'll come to doctors and pharmacists and people and have these conversations. So what I would tell viewers is be very optimistic, but ask questions and understand how this vaccine works, how it can benefit your family, and also identify the risks. But good news, Allison, in phase three of both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, there were no serious adverse events seen to date. And that's a combined se a sample set of almost 100,000 patients mm -hmm. just in the United States wow. alone. Dr. Patel, it is so rare that we start off the week saying we've got good COVID news. So uh, thrilled to hear that. And thank you so much for just helping our viewers better understand what getting a vaccine and what uh, developing resistance to the coronavirus might look like. Really appreciate it. Thank you.